Okay. And uh, as Daniel already said, I'm the coordinator of this project. A few words before uh, and before leaving the, the floor to the, the panelists uh, to briefly explain the rationale of the project that we are about to conclude today. That is also the day when the new national action plan on women, peace and security will be released and also in occasion of the celebration of International Human Day, Human Rights Day. And um, so as Daniele already advanced, women empowerment, gender equality are universally recognized as fundamental condition to maintain peace and security. This is especially true in context of crisis and transition, where the respect of women's human rights, as well as their full and equal involvement in decision-making areas represents key elements for achieving social and political stability. Since the 2011, women's movement and association took an active part in the protest across all the MENA region, trying to combine the demands for democracy and change with those for gender equality. And the same is happening in Sudan and Algeria today. So building on that, the research project had the twofold aims, basically. The first aim was to deepen the knowledge of women participation and activism during and after the revolutionary processes that led to the fall of a regime of Bouteflika and Bashir last year. That means what is the genesis, what the form of women's struggle in this country and what their claims and demands. Moreover, I think the research also helped in identifying the breakpoints and that of continuity regarding the situation of women empowerment in both countries. On the other hand, we had the ambition and the project that had the ambition to collect the voice of women directly involved in these processes let's say the voices from the ground, with the aim to spread these voices and the experience in a some simple, direct, uh, and uh, if you want, non-mediated way, even to a larger audience of non-experts. With this aim, we try to adopt an innovative approach, which combines desk research, as well as uh, qualitative interviews, developed through questionnaires with uh, an approach more artistic, if you want, with the audio and visual <laughs> output. So beside, beside the development of final uh, written report, collecting research results in Italy, Sudan, and also Algeria, some of the interviews realized have been edited in form of video or podcast. And I really recommend everyone who looks to us today to, to, to see and watch this material because it is really very rich and interesting. I want also to underline that uh, we, we tried to put in the local perspective at the core of the project. And in order to do so, we involved the local partners active in reporting and supporting women reivindication. This helped us and the research in being authentically linked to the reality to Sudan and Algeria. Local partners have been, have been involved in drafting the research question, drafting the tools <coughs> and in the field work, also obviously in drafting report and produce audio video uh, material that are really very interesting. I would also underline that uh, our partner works despite the enormous difficulties that they have to face in this particular period and uh, taking in account also the restriction imposed by COVID and in the case of Sudan also natural events like flood. So it's uh, very important for us to, to, to thank you for your great, your great job really. So just add that the local perspective was 
in Sudan and Algeria was completed by, um, by the, perspec the perspective of Sudanese and Algerian women living uh, in Italy in order to give a broader understanding of women activism also abroad, taking in account the role the diaspora play in supporting the uh, revolution in, in both countries. So I stop here. I think I, I took too much time. We have a small video can, that we would like to share with you is uh, from Sudan, from Al Harisat, that was one of the two partners that worked with us. I don't know, Daniel, if you can play the video. Yes. Okay. Thank you, and then we, uh, and then we will leave the floor to our panelists. Okay. Thank you. السودان والرجال في السودان والشباب والشابات والاطفال والكهول يعني الشعب السوداني وصل لحد من من الضغط النفسي الكبير الخلاه ما يرضى بالواقع اكثر من كذا النظام الفات كان نظام خاص في مجتمعه قد يكون فات يعني اسس لنا لحاجه كعب شديد اللي هي موضوع المسؤوليه بالإضافة للإدماج الدين والإسلام السياسي في المجتمع اللي قيد وكبل من حريات الناس كثير والتفسير الخاطئ للدين والتدين الإسلام السياسي انتزع مننا حرياتنا نحن كنساء وامتهن كرامتنا كنساء فالحاجة دي كلها أثرت علينا وخلتنا نفكر في أنه نحن مفروض نصور في الوضع واننا نقاوم الاشكال التسلط الكبير الواقع علينا من الحاجات الكويسه اللي خلقتها لنا الثوره خلقتها لي انا كامل او كولايتنا في قلب الكردفان في انه بقى فيها مساحه التعبير الاعتراف المجتمعي بالنساء خاصه بعد المشاركه الكبيره جدا من النساء في في موضوع الثوره فده سهل شديد في انه يفتح لك مساحه انه تشتغل بشكل افضل. الجانب ما مرضي له شديد وهسي بتمنى انه يمشي أن الحاجه تمشي فيه يعني مثلا هسي موضوع التغيير في المجتمع المحلي في غزه الكردفان، يعني مثلا في لانه دايما على الاساس الغبلي جدا يعني عندنا اي مجموعات اهليه في حل النزاعات والمشاكل وكذا، فانا بحس ان الموضوع المفروض يتطور شويه. في المفروض يكون في ناس الحكم المحلي يمشوا باتجاه القانون للاداره الاهليه او ابتكار مجالس للمصالحات يكون مشاركه النساء فيها بدرجه اكبر عشان النساء ذاتهم هم بطبعهم جانحات للسلم ودعمات لفكره التسامح والسماح والبناء السلام والاستقرار بتمنى انه نقدر ناسس لاستقرار مجتمعي لبناء سلام مجتمعي لمجموعات نسائيه في غرب كردفان قادره تحدد احتياجاتها شنو ووضعها المأمول الدائرة تصلي في فتره ثانيه يكون الطريق بالنسبه لها واضح والاليات اللي اعطوها في انه تنتهي مسارات محدده ويكون في دعم لها من كل يعني قطاعات الدوله اذا كان قطاع خاص Thank you, Daniele. It was really just an example. So I give the floor to Tin Hinan El Kadi. Ms. Tin Hinan El Kadi is PhD researcher at the London School of Economics and Political Science, Associate Fellow at Chatham House, and also she drafted the Algerian case study. 
So Tina, it's up to you. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for, for the invitation. Very happy to be able uh, to speak about Algerian women and, and transition. Well, first of all, when Lorenzo kind of contacted, contacted us to speak about the project, well, I was like, what transition <laughs> are we talking about? The truth is that in Algeria, unlike in Sudan, and Sarah will speak more about it later, we, we haven't really seen a democratic transition. If anything, we've seen a change in political facade where some uh, personnel within the civilian elite was changed, uh, but it was very cosmetic uh, reforms without any significant change. If anything, there is a substantial setback in terms of freedoms. So whether we're talking about freedom of press, freedom of expression, uh, political freedoms in different forms, uh, where we're just witnessing a, a real authoritarian backlash. Uh, and so in this, it's not, you know, my, my talk and, and my, my paper for this report was not about the, the new rights that Algerian women gained after the Hirak, which uh, took place in 2019, but rather uh, what role they played within that movement, because uh, arguably the movement has not succeeded in achieving a democratic transition. Uh, so my piece, so basically uh, the way I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to try and be uh, as uh, brief as I can to leave enough time for, for discussion. Uh, I will just be assessing the role of Algerian women in democratic construction in, in Algeria through history. And so we'll start with a brief kind of um, section where we'll historicize the role of women in modern Algeria. And then uh, I will be discussing the, the role of women in, in the Hirak uh, movement, which is the popular movement um, which happened in uh, 2019 and was only brought to a halt due to the corona uh, virus pandemic. So um, Algeria is quite specific compared to other countries in, in the region uh, in the sense that women have uh, played a significant role in, in the country's independence, maybe more than other countries. And this might be linked to the particular colonial history of, of Algeria, which is quite peculiar. Uh, so we see during the independence movement against French colonialism between 1954 and 1962, an important involvement of Algerian women within the uh, struggle for independence. And so uh, women uh, in that period were obviously also suffering from, from French colonialism and, and they participated massively within the FLN. So we're counting over 10,000 uh, women participating as actual fighters. So not only like having administrative roles within the FLN at that time, uh, and it represented about uh, a bit more than 3% of uh, active fighters uh, in the war. And so this is actually comparable to, to the share of women uh, participating in armed struggle during World War II. So it, it is quite something. And, and so these women uh, were, were very young, uh, often under 25. 74% uh, of these women were actually under 25 and uh, they, they, they contributed fully to, to the war for independence. And this actually paid off. So at the country's independence in 1962, gender equality was actually recognized. So if we had to compare the situation of women's freedom today and what it was right in 1963, well, it was better legally in 1963, like purely in terms of like, you know, texts and, and, and laws. Uh, so the first country's constitution in 1963 uh, recognized gender equality. So um, there is article 12, which stated that uh, all citizens of both sex have the same rights and the same duties. So this was accepted 
uh, as, as a, a norm. And, and then women right after independence and the two decades after independence, so right until the, the, the early 1980s, uh, saw a significant increase in their participation to, to public life. So we had an increasing number of women going to universities, women becoming doctors, engineers, uh, Algerian women even like joined the, the police forces uh, and you had uh, a real industrial policy at the time. So it was during the uh, Boumedian era and there was a real uh, state strategy for modernization and women had a role to play within that. So th there was a significant investment in education, in healthcare, uh, in, in industrialization also, and, and women uh, were actively participating in this kind of uh, state-led development project. Then comes the end of the 1980s and the rise of Islamist, Islamic fundamentalism, right? And so here we see the first major setbacks for women for, for women's rights in Algeria. And the most important one is the 1984 family law. So this law was basically um, adopted to reduce uh, the right of women within, within society. It recognizes that women are, are not equal to men and that they are eternal minors uh, who um, have to, to, to exist under the, the guardianship of, of a male figure. And, and so th there was a lot of internal resistance by feminist movements and even Mujahidat who took part in the uh, liberation war in the 50s who fought against this law, but it was still adopted. So this was very much the product of a political bargain between a regime that was kind of starting to lose its legitimacy from the whole kind of independence narrative that had to give out something to remain in power. And so as soon as the Islamic fundamentalist threats rose in the 1980s, the Algerian regime sacrificed women's rights as a first step. So that was adopted in 1984. Um, we saw during this period uh, a move for, uh, th there was a reaction with a lot of feminist organizations being created at that time. Uh, we can count, we can like name the Association for Equality, which uh, was born in 1985. Uh, it was led by Khalida Saudi and Louisa Hanoun, who's still like uh, an important uh, female political figure in Algeria today. Uh, and, and then in 1988, there was obviously the, the, the well-known uh, October uprising. And Algerians like to say that this was the first instance of the Arab Spring, because the October 1988, Eight, uh, movement forced the move from a one-party system to multi-partism. So with this move, we also saw an increase in, in female organizations. There was the organization of Foi des Femmes, which organized a lot of uh, rallies to protest against the, the unjust family law. Uh, that was uh, Association des Cris des Femmes and a lot of, of political gatherings and organization around that time. However, the most important political force, as you might know, was uh, not this female uh, feminist organizations, but the, the FIS, the Front Islamique du Salut, so the Islamic Front of um, Salvation. And, uh, it, you know, the, the, the was in the first multi-party uh, election, the, the FIS won, and this was succeeded by the, the army stepping in and interrupting the electoral process. Uh, this episode led to a bloody civil war in the 1990s with an estimated 150,000 uh, civilians dying and, and over 6,000 victims of forced disappearances. And so this period was very violent uh, for, for Algerian society as a whole, but I would argue that it was even more violent, violent for women who were suffering from, from this kind of, you know, for Islamic fundamentalism, women 
was kind of like this point of focalization as they represent this modernity and like, you know, women working was kind of the, the in what illustrated the the shift away from traditional values women the the, inc the rise of women in in the public sphere was seen as like the, this major threat and some authors have argued that the rise of islamic fundamentalism in algeria was actually a reaction to the rapid modernization that took place uh, right after independence. And that this modernization process that happened in the 60s and 70s happened too fast, which led to the reaction and the, the, the rise of regressive forces that came to, to fight it. And, and so during this period, the 1990s, a lot of feminist activists were killed, uh, most notably uh, Nabila Jahnin, who was ass assassinated by, by terrorist groups, but also um, random civilians uh, who were killed for not wearing the veil, such as uh, Katia Ben Ghana, but we're counting uh, thousands of similar cases. And then there was the period post the civil war, if we can broadly put it in like kind of the two decades of Bouteflika's rule. So that was uh, between 2000 and 2019. And during this period, we saw important socioeconomic improvement for women. And so women became the leading group uh, in uh, Algerian universities. So the share of women in Algerian universities uh, is at the moment above uh, 60%. So you see more women than men at universities. There was also an increase of women's participation in the labor market. However, it remains very small. So according to official World Bank data, it's around 18%. But this is just for the formal sector. For those who know uh, Algeria and other developing countries, the share of the informal sector is very important. And, and so you have, still a very low uh, participation rate for women in the labor market, although there was an important catch up um, after, after the turn of the century. Uh, most women in Algeria work in flexible informal jobs that tend to be um, poorly remunerated and lack social protection. And this is still an enduring issue uh, at the moment. During that period, we saw that the regime tried to instrumentalize women's rights. So it, it continued in, in this policy. So the most important uh, policy move for them <clears throat> was the 2012 introduction of a parliamentary quota. So this is happening right after the Arab Spring. So during the Arab Spring, you had like, you know, in Tunisia, uprisings and regimes falling. And the Algerian regime felt under threat at the time, was under Bouteflika's rule. And the, the, the system adopted a set of superficial reforms, among which was a law to impose a 30% quota for women in, in parliament and actually all elected bodies in Algeria. And so as it stands, like Algeria has like 34% of women in its parliament, which is one of the highest rates, if not the highest in, in the MENA region. However, these changes are very superficial and have always been done for, you know, the, the Algerian system to kind of please the international community and say, hey, look, we have this feminine parliament and it's a signaling change while well, really there hasn't been any like substantive changes. Uh, and even when we look at the type of women who participate to, to parliament, it's often part of the regime's clientele. And it's not, you know, women who, who went in like fighting for women's rights or trying to advance the status of, of Algerian women. Uh, yeah, so this was the situation pretty much up until the end of, of 2019. The family code was obviously maintained. So there was a set of superficial reforms, but, you know, without any significant transformation as the, the, the unjust family code uh, is still in place. Then comes the uh, February 22 movement. So and on February 22nd, um, tens of thousands of, uh, of Algerians took to the streets to say that, uh, you know, they were seeking 
something else and that Bouteflika could not run for a fifth presidential term. And if the, 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 the protest movement succeeded in, in blocking uh, a, a fifth presidential term, it did not, as I was saying earlier, succeed in <coughs> producing you know, broader, broader political change. So in this movement, and just to reflect on, on the role of women, I think the most significant contribution of women in, in the Hirak, so this popular movement, was really to keep the peaceful nature of the movement. So you saw an impressive number of, of Algerian women participating to the protests and not just in Algiers or Iran, but even in inner cities. So this is a very important sociological shift uh, because unlike the October 1988 uprising, where which was like predominantly like male dominated, you have very, very little women uh, participating, which ended up, you know, becoming like riots and you had like the army intervening, killing like over 500 young people. This protest movement in 2018 was characterized <laughs> by a large participation of women and children actually. And this has arguably helped keep the peaceful nature of the protest movement. Uh, and so, and actually to kind of, you know, measure this, the only times there was kind of excess of violence used by the, the, the police forces was usually after 5 p.m. So the movement will be every Friday, it was a weekly movement and every Tuesday for students and Fridays for like broader population. And it was after five when uh, most women and families would be gone like home that you see these clashes happening with police forces kind of being confronted to young men as a you know a prime target and so and there are a large there is a large literature actually um accounting for the role of women in protest movements and the role of women for keeping the peaceful nature of of uh protest movements so one of the strongest like uh, slogans of, of the Herak movement is Silmiya, which literally means peaceful. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people were really impressed by, by this movement because it ended up galvanizing millions of Algerians across the country without any major, um, you know, instances of violence. And so this is quite a, a historical thing for, for, you know, our part of the world, but also, you know, in the in the global north. Um, yeah, so um, the Herak, so starting from March 8th, uh, an even more important representation of women, because the movement started on February 22nd, and just two weeks later, there was the, celeb the, the celebration of the International Women's Day. And on that day, so it was uh, the 8th of March, you had a significant presence of women in the streets. That, that was really impressive. I was myself in Algiers and I, I, it was really something like, a, a, you know, the presence of women was really important. And there was no instances of, you know, for having been there, um, harassment or, or, you know, gender violence, you could see that the population was all united against a common goal of uh, stopping the crazy project of a fifth presidential term. And uh, so starting from that Friday of um, March 8th, there was uh, a, what we call the carré féministe, which, which like appeared on the streets of Algiers. So that is a feminist square. And you had a lot of feminist activists and feminist organizations gathering there every week with slogans that asked for what was what came to be called the double rupture. So they asked for a rupture with the uh, authoritarian state and a rupture with its corrupt practices and its uh, repressive practices, but also a rupture with the patriarchy and gender inequality and gender unequal laws. So the 
there the, the was like double demands and the slogans in that square, the feminist square, were very interesting because, you know, they were asking for, for more than just regime change and yeah, also for, for more gender equality. Uh, there were some, some clashes with uh, conservative forces but they, they remain insignificant. I think that for the regressive forces present in the Hedag, it was a bit of a shock. But then the, the, the considerable, actually the, the, the numbers of women there and, and the solidarity they had from other protesters allowed them to remain and occupy the public sphere uh, in safety. And so that was uh, an important thing. And I think it, it, for, for people studying Algeria, it was important to see that because it very much signaled a change in, uh, within Algerian society. It's something that we would not have been able to see maybe in the early 2000s, right after the civil war. That, you know, but today you can see that there was a lot of maturing and, and much more tolerance within, within the movement. We know the Herak entailed very, very different political preferences and aspirations. So from you had the conservatives, the liberals, the left wing, the, the feminists, and, and overall this movement like succeeded in maintaining its unity. Uh, despite not succeeding in, in changing regime. An important characteristic of female participation in the Herag is also the fact that uh, figures from the liberation movement also joined in, showing that there is this continuity of women's participation in, in the construction of the Algerian state, but also the construction of its, its democracy. So the most notable figure is Jamila Bouhirid, who is this huge figure who participated in the Battle of Algiers and actually played a key role in the Battle of Algiers. And, and she, she participated in many of, of the, the Herak marches every Friday uh, and yeah, showing that th there was this link between the past and the present. Um, as it stands, and I, want, I, I will wrap up soon to, to give time to, to Sarah and the others, uh, yeah, in terms of policy recommendations, uh, I think that uh, what's important really is uh, for Algerians to start deconstructing the whole stereotype that promoting women's rights in Algeria is for the elites. And I think that female feminist organizations in Algeria are starting to do this work, uh, although it takes time in a context of, you know, closed media and lack of, of freedom of expression. Uh, there's also, uh, I think, the need, obviously, to reinforce the rule of law and install regulations that, that respect uh, gender equality. But I don't think that this will happen under the current regime. And what we're seeing now is that the, the, so in the new constitution, which was adopted but like largely boycotted on November 1st, they, they, they constitutionalized new rights for women, uh, but this does not have any significant implications in the sense that, you know, most of the rights in uh, the new Algerian constitutions are not respected because it, it entails, for instance, the freedom of, of press, but you still see journalists in jail. And it's very similar for women. So they do constitutionalize these rights, but then in practice, you, you don't see this happening no. because in practice, the, the family code is still, is still in place. Uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna stop here and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you very much. So I leave directly the floor to Sara. Please, Sara, respect the time. We have more or less 10 minutes <laughs> otherwise. Okay. Okay, I'll do my best. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I will try in this. Um, hello, everyone, first of all, and good evening. Um, I am very happy to be here on behalf of my team uh, and uh, initiative at Harisat. Uh, I will try in this um, minute uh, to um, give an idea, a short, uh, um, a brief introduction to who we are and um, the implementation part of the project in Sudan. 
Um, Al Harisat uh, is an Arabic name, literally means the female guards. A community we are a community-based initiative founded by a group of women uh, in December 2018 at the beginning of the uh, popular Sudan revolution um, uh, to expand women's participation in the movement for freedom, peace uh, and justice. Um, we have um, many objectives. Our main objective is um, to empower women um, through advocating for values of freedom, peace, and justice, and uh, especially um, regard, um, regarding the manifestation of uh, the status of women. Um, we are working towards the elimination of any uh, form of uh, degrading uh, the dignity of women in all aspects of life and building uh, women and youth capacity in different aspects. Um, our membership is uh, quite big and diverse. Um, also, our partnership, uh, aside of CHESPI, we are working on a project with um, uh, different uh, international organizations. Um, um, I will move fast <laughs> on this part, and I will start uh, already with the implementation of the project. So, uh, women in transition, the role of women and uh, in the Arab Spring uh, too, in Algeria and Sudan, um, in order for us in Sudan to capture uh, the role of women in the transitional period and in the revolution, um, we asked ourselves, or like we had a statement as our hypothesis uh, of this research project <clears throat> that says um, the factors that kept Sudanese women away from active political participation before the revolution will continue to hold them back after unless serious and committed actions are taken. Um, to test this hypothesis, um, we, um, Im we implemented uh, a qualitative uh, field work um, uh, identifying target characters uh, as a subject of 12 interviews. Um, the data was collected through semi-structured interviews um, and um, the, nominee, uh, the interviewees were uh, nominated uh, from a wide range of um, Sudanese feminists and human rights uh, activists, uh, of course, always ensuring the diversity of the group. Um, the interviews were uh, prepared in English, conducted in Arabic, and once again, the final product was translated in English. Um, I will briefly mention the challenges that uh, Lorenzo already uh, highlighted at the beginning. Of course, in addition to COVID-19, Sudan uh, in September faced um, um, very uh, severe floods that um, uh, took uh, almost 17 states out of the 18. Um, that actually created a, a big delay for our schedule. And uh, we are thankful to the support of our colleagues at Chespi uh, and their patience through these, um, through these times. Uh, also, of course, the political and um, uh, economic uh, tense situation in Sudan that is um, rapidly changing every day has been um, a, a great source of, um, of limitation. Uh, however, um, we managed to achieve the goals of, of this research project. Um, the, que the questions of the, of, the, of the research were um, formed and structured around um, uh, four main areas that are, in, um, our, in our opinion, has the biggest influence on uh, women political participation in Sudan. Um, I, I mentioned the four areas that are the cultural norm, norms, the political Islam, uh, the institutional uh, factors and the economic factors. Um, of course, um, there are other aspects. However, these are, uh, let's say, the, the more um, overwhelming um, at the moment. Uh, now I will take you through a brief journey through the, the research paper. Of course, I will not read it uh, for you, but um, I will try to mention uh, the most reflective points on it. Um, I will start with the role of women um, in the Sudanese uh, feminist movement. Um, let's say um, Sudan has uh, quite a strong history uh, of, uh, of feminism, um, um, especially um, uh, we, are, we have that the, the Sudanese uh, uh, Women Union uh, was established in 1952, um, that is um, a few years before its independence. 
Um, and at the beginning, it focused on the education um, rights and the work rights. And already in 1953, um, women political rights became one of the agenda of the, um, of the union. Um, as for the role of the Sudanese women during the revolution, uh, of course, the whole world, uh, thanks to the uh, social media now, uh, the whole world witnessed uh, and acknowledged the role of Sudanese women in the current political change, starting from leading the protests and um, participating in the sit-in in front of the military headquarters uh, um, in April 2019. Um, uh, also, this was again, of course, just like the Algerian um, colleagues, uh, again, is a lot of social and uh, norms that are restricting and uh, condemning such participation. Women's role was uh, a key shape, uh, uh, shape of the transitional uh, period constitutional document, and women continue to play a um, role uh, to fight for their legit legitimate uh, equal partnership across the different political sectors. Uh, facts and figures are included in the research paper. Uh, of course, you can, you can go back to it. Um, of course, after such contribution, the Sudanese women had demands and expectations uh, after the revolution from the transitional period. Um, I mentioned a few of them here. Uh, these were, of course, all uh, captured from, um, from the uh, contribution of our, our interviewees. Uh, a proper recognition on documentation of women's role in the uprising and the revolution, inclusion of gender agenda uh, state uh, at a state strategic level, uh, uh, dismantling the former regime oppressive institutions and fundamental uh, groups, uh, structural reforms to eliminate laws and legislations that were negatively targeting women, uh, gendered e um, economic policies, um, ending conflicts and uh, demilitarization of the state. Um, these were the demands mentioned um, uh, by our interviewees and um, the achievements uh, in their opinion so far uh, on, this, uh, on these demands was uh, the following. Um, ensuring women participation in the transitional government institutions by 40% as mentioned in the constitutional document of 2019. Um, the text of peace uh, of the of the peace agreement was highly gender sensitive in mentioning the rights of, uh, for men and women as equal, including women participation in the peacekeeping and reform of the uh, military and security. Um, another achievement uh, so far is the um, transitional government has appointed four women ministers out of 22 and two women as, uh, uh, in, the, in the severing council out of 11. And we have two governors, uh, uh, female governors for the first time in Sudan um, appointed recently. Of course, this was um, faced with a lot of rejection, a lot of um, uh, uh, resistance from uh, not only standard, uh, standard people in the society, but also by the elite uh, of the political parties. Unfortunately, just to show how critical is still the situation for um, uh, females in Sudan and for their political participation. Another achievement um, is the, that has been some legal amendments, uh, for example, the uh, abolishment of the public order law that was uh, a very humiliating uh, law for the, for the females in Sudan. Uh, one single aspect of it was um, arresting women based on how they are dressed. And um, like the law itself did not include any um, specifications of what this dressing should be. It was always left for the um, judgment of the law enforcer. Um, this is considered a great achievement for Sudanese women that this um, law has been, um, uh, has been abolished recently. Uh, also, there has been many positive changes in the uh, family law in the favor of women and some improvement uh, in the freedom expression uh, areas and with limitations, of course. Um, these were the achievements. Now, the challenges ahead, uh, we can list them as the resistance of the system to fulfill um, the agreed upon women quota in the political participation, which we saw already in, the, in appointing the governors, 
um, and naturally the resistance to increase the quota. Uh, this is a daily challenge now. Uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, forming the parliament, the Sudanese parliament, and again, this topic is, is becoming um, a hustle. Um, the economic uh, and political instability contributes to pushing gender agenda in the bottom of the government priorities, uh, even if the goodwill uh, is there. Uh, the sensitivity of the fight against political and radical Islam uh, present, present a hinder and constraints um, in the gender agenda, um, and served justice uh, in many pending cases creates an environment of hostility holds back that holds back the, the uh, progress in many uh, files, especially war and conflict um, and political related crimes uh, and misconducts. Um, looking at these challenges and um, the unfulfilled demands, there are a lot of recommendations and measures to be taken uh, to meet the aspiration of women uh, in Sudan with regard to efficient and effic uh, effective uh, political participation of women. However, we try to find one single uh, recommendation that we believe it's a key uh, to the rest of the measures. Um, and we decided to highlight it um, in, this, uh, in this brief uh, presentation. Um, we would say that to address challenges and demands mentioned above, uh, the main key is a national and international effort to be, um, to be geared towards supporting uh, the building of civil democratic system and institutions in Sudan, to stand by the civilian government agenda, uh, for change also in the uh, front line uh, of its war against the deep state. Sudanese women movement can only be effective under a democratic civilian led government with open space for women participation. This is uh, more or less uh, a general overview over the uh, for the paper for the research paper. I would like at the end to uh, mention here um, the video and the podcasts. Uh, we saw a briefly part of one of them at the beginning. Uh, we are. I believe like the core of the of the res of the of this project was the research paper. However, these videos were the artistic part uh, was of great importance to us. And we are really thankful to, to Jespi for coming with this idea that we are suffering in Sudan from the lack of documentation of the women activism, uh, the lack of actually also visual documentation to be specific. Um, and this was a great chance for us as well in Al Harisat as a team um, with our daily hustle starting from the 19th of December 2018. Uh, again, it's all these forms of challenges and problems, natural and political. Um, we just took a moment and looked at these videos and appreciated the real um, uh, work and, and reoriented ourselves towards the real goals that we are. We are um, setting in front of us. So I would like at the end to, to thank uh, Chespi team for their support and um, their patience <laughs> for all the, the hustles and delays. Uh, I would like to thank our participants um, who we interviewed. I hope some of them are among our, um, our partic participants of this um, uh, podcast uh, broadcast today um, that uh, that they found, found the time and made the effort to participate and found the courage, uh, especially in these um, fragile times uh, in, in Sudan. I would like to thank uh, Al the team, uh, my team from Al Harisat, uh, who worked hard on this uh, project, Nuha Youssef, Nazik Kabellu, Yusriya Awad, Shirin Noor, um, Abdin Abdel Razik, uh, and, and the Kamal, and of course, uh, Hadi Hasaballah, the founder of Al Harisat. Thank you so much for giving this uh, opportunity, and uh, I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Sada. Really, thank you. Thank you very much. So, we have not much time, so I leave directly the floor to Ambassador Sebastiano Cardi, um, Director General for Political and Security Affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation to CSP, uh, to CSP Chairman Piero Fassino, of course, uh, Daniele Frigeri, 
Lorenzo Goslovi, who is the coordinator. And by the way, thank you for the to the two panelists for the uh, the very interesting um, outline were both of the historical, you know, uh, developments in your uh, countries, but also on the current state of affairs and the role you have played and your organization played uh, in the current transition, which are, of course, very, very important for a country like Italy also, uh, not only from the bilateral point of view, but also as a, a country that is so involved in the Mediterranean and MENA region affairs. And by the way, I'd like to say again that the project that we are discussing today holds a significant relevance for our ministry uh, because, of course, it combines two of the priorities of our foreign policy, women empowerment. I just had a VTC uh, two hours ago on the uh, celebration of, uh, you know, the uh, Declaration on, Euro on Human Rights. We talked a lot about women's rights because, you know, today is one of the priorities for us and for the world. Of course, gender equality, but of course also, as I said before, our interest for the, the destiny of Italy as a Mediterranean country and the relation with our neighbors, <clears throat> such as, uh, you know, Algeria, but also Sudan. Uh, uh, by the way, I would like just to mention that uh, Minister Di Maio visited uh, uh, Algeria uh, just a few days ago, and uh, Deputy Minister De Re met with uh, Sudan Minister of Foreign Affairs in October. Just to say how intense are the <clears throat> bilateral relations uh, with uh, your, your country. Uh, so the backing and funding that uh, we have provided as ministry uh, to this project within the framework of uh, the third national action plan, which has expired on women, peace and security, is, uh, we think, we hope, is a sign of our commitment to women empowerment and to promoting the meaningful uh, participation of women, especially in peace, in peace processes. Uh, <clears throat> I was ambassador to the UN for five years, so I know a little bit about, uh, you know, UN or international mediation or peace process. And uh, certainly the, the, the actual, the, the issue of uh, giving a broader role to women is there. I remember that one of the issues when we were <clears throat> at the UN was the role of UN female peacekeepers, for example. Uh, <clears throat> it is very important also to put on the field uh, women that can uh, help UN operations uh, perform better. And I must say that Italy is, uh, was at that time, few years, two years ago when I was in New York, uh, proud to have an average women peacekeepers higher than the, the average, which was not very high, by the way, 5%. So we should do more in this respect. And I think the UN and Guterres is doing to try uh, exactly that. So you know that um, in December 2016, we approved the Italy Third National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, uh, which has expired last year. Uh, for the first time, actually, the Italian Parliament, which is uh, playing a big role, allocated 4 million euros in support of the plan implementation, and this is why we have founded this project, of course. Uh, this makes Italy one of the few countries uh, devoting public funding to the implementation of uh, a national action plan. And we founded 35 projects uh, throughout this period, and uh, we are, I think, very proud of that. Uh, I would also like to say to remember that in October 2017, and I was in the Security Council, I was the Italian representative there uh, during our mandate in the UNSC, uh, uh, we launched the Mediterranean Women Mediators Networks, which brings together uh, a diverse group of uh, more than 50 qualified medi women mediators from 21 Mediterranean countries, four of them, by the way, from Algeria. Um, and we think this response to the need to foster women uh, participation in peace processes, uh, mediation efforts, and peace building uh, in a region that we know very well is key for, um, for our security, for your security, and for uh, global peace and stability. Uh, so we are sparing no efforts to further develop the network, the, the women network, 
uh, and we are quite proud of the results it has achieved so far. New members joined. Uh, we have three local antennas in Cyprus, Turkey, and Kosovo, where uh, recently established new ones will be open in the future. <coughs> uh, so we are providing opportunities to train, capacity building, and networking, of course. Uh, <clears throat> in this view, we, we think uh, uh, it's important to remind, as uh, uh, was said before, that today, our Interministerial Committee for Human Rights, right today, has released the recently approved fourth national action plan on women, peace, and security that will cover the term 2020-2024. So uh, the timing, of course, of the announcement is very appropriate. As I said before, uh, today we celebrate the International Human Rights Day. Uh, all the initiatives, of course, uh, are inspired by our belief that uh, peace, sustainable peace, especially in lasting conflict prevention, can be achieved only if uh, uh, peace negotiations are inclusive, uh, all segments of the society being able to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, participate, especially women and young people. And, uh, and in this, I really believe there is plenty of evidence that when women, women are meaningful, be meaningfully involved, as was told uh, to us by our two uh, panelists, um, uh, peace agreements or peace transitions or uh, transition periods are more likely to be reached, more likely to last, and by the way, as we heard, more likely to be peaceful instead of violent. Uh, and of course, the countries included in your project are no exception. Uh, of course, I, I will not dwell into the Sudanese and Algerian uh, uh, examples because we have explained it very well. Uh, the, poten the potential is there. There are progress. You have said it uh, quite clearly. A lot remains to be done. But uh, our hope is that through these projects, uh, we can uh, together uh, continue to engage uh, civil society and the government to try to give a better, a better and bigger role uh, uh, in the, for women and for especially young women. Of course. Uh, so women, we again, we are really convinced, and this is my testimony today, are, um, that women are powerful agents of change at grassroots level, uh, and uh, they, they can be drivers of positive and unifying narratives within our societies, all of us, even in Italy, of course, and in so-called advanced countries, uh, involving women in uh, law enforcement, civil society, government, and other sectors, brings perspectives that uh, we think represent meaning, meaningful force and effective uh, uh, narratives against the polarizing and hateful ideologies promoted by, by the way, by terrorist groups. Uh, and of course, yes, uh, women are still heavily underrepresented, represented in peace processes, as I've said, uh, and this required a shift, change. And uh, of course, we celebrate also this year the 20th anniversary, anniversary of the Resolution 30, uh, 1325, uh, which is the linchpin of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. <coughs> We should redouble our efforts to ensure its full implementation. Much remains to be done, of course. But Italy is resolved to renew this commitment and will take uh, in due consideration, I can assure you, uh, the recommendations proposed by CESPI and by yourself uh, in, this, uh, in this report. So I will uh, stop here. I don't think we have much time, but uh, I think uh, other people must uh, talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much. So I, I just leave the floor to Ambassador um, Laura Mirakian. And uh, we have uh, still, uh, okay, we have not so much time really. So uh, I think we have uh, 20 minutes uh, we can take uh, at 
least 20, 25 minutes, 20 minutes, okay, let's say, to close the, 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 the webinar. So please, Ms. Ambassador Mirakian. Thank you very much. From uh, reports of the two uh, speakers, uh, who I thank you very much. And uh, from uh, the comprehensive report which was prepared for this uh, event, um, seems to me that I understand that the work is in progress. There are some uh, positive advancement, uh, but also there is a serious risk to go back. Uh, this is not new in our life. When I say our life, I say women's life. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, as the Algerian, uh, but also the, the Sudanese colleagues are explaining, sometimes, you know, for a while, we achieve some good results, but then the next generation is uh, going back. Um, so what has been achieved has to be maintained. Maintenance is, uh, is the right word. Uh, nowadays, looking at the overall scenario, uh, of course, we are in the middle, in the middle of a big storm. Uh, the storm is the pandemic, of course, and also the overall recession. recession which uh, has a negative repercussion in our countries, in your countries uh, as well. Um, Algeria is an oil producing, producing country, so I think that the repercussions are quite heavy. Um, I was uh, looking uh, recently at the global humanitarian overview of the UN, the most recent report, and uh, the report is signaling that uh, Sudan is um, in, a, in a real trouble, also because this flow of refugees coming from Tigray are converging towards the Sudanese territory. So, I mean, there is a, a, a very complex uh, situation. Um, and we have to, to say that uh, historically, you know, the women and children are the first victims of conflicts, economic deprivation, poverty. Um, and it goes usually hand in hand with uh, their own country general uh, scenario. Um, I, think that I, I think that you don't, uh, you're not surprised if I say that the Beijing platform 1995, maybe you weren't born yet, but this, <laughs> this platform was not very helpful for women empowerment. Uh, but it was not a help, a helpful for also Resolution 1325. Resolution 20, 1325, uh, which was presented as a great achievement, in fact, many times in many situations, in many scenarios, uh, uh, had the opposite, opposite, very serious opposite effects. Um, I want to emphasize, at the contrary, Agenda 2030 of the UN, UN Agenda 2030, because this agenda for the first time, uh, for the first time, rather than uh, dealing with gender issue in isolation, it recognized that there is a, a direct link between the scenario the, in the country and the situation where women are living. Um, in other words, uh, tackling issues as poverty, health, uh, food security, agriculture, education, access to clean water, sustainable energy, climate change, and so on and so forth, gives women a crucial opportunity to achieve empowerment. 
and conquer a public space. And at the same time, gender is a cross-sector issue. And women are, can be active agents for change. So it is the situation, of, the gender issue is not to be tackled uh, in isolation, but together with the overall situation in the country and in the world, I would say. Um, what do, do they have in, when I, when I, when I was uh, preparing this uh, intervention, I was just wondering what is uh, that uh, Sudan and Nigeria have in common? Well, I understood they have in common the fact that a transitional phase has been initiated very recently, and also that some results has been achieved, as uh, Sarah was explaining in, uh, in uh, Sudan, a little bit less and more precarious in Nigeria, if I well understand, but we are advancing. Uh, uh, what I liked very much, of, I like very much of uh, your movement, your gender movement in your country, as far as I understand, is that, uh, for instance, they are free from uh, ideological, um, or secular, or religious printings, and they they want to be comprehensive of various sectors of the society, which is quite new, because as you know, you know, the, the, the gender movement in our country, for instance, was very much led by middle class women, uh, very educated women. So it was not, uh, some sectors were quite marginalized, maybe also in your countries, but you are stating that you want to be to, uh, comprehensive, which is important. Uh, and also that you want to be free from ideological printing. Um, I heard some of the, of the women in your country speaking about, uh, uh, you, yourself were speaking about the democracy. Uh, what does it mean democracy in your mind? I think that if I well understand, can be resumed in three words. Freedom, of course, justice, equality, not equity, equality, and justice. I was serving in an Arab country for a long time, and uh, the word justice, also the UN, uh, you know, the word justice is continuously repeated, you know, uh, in private and on the microphone. The, and again, I found this word justice, uh, you know, in your slogan, uh, which is um, something that they comprehend justice, uh, uh, social justice, but also personal, in your personal life. So it's together, you know, a fight, uh, a institutional fight, a social fight, and a personal fight. And, and for freedom is the same. Freedom in personal life, freedom in social life, and freedom legally in the institutional life. So it has been like this in our country as well. So, you know, uh, we, can, uh, we can join you um, all the concepts that we are uh, elaborating, uh, very well known. Um, I think that Hinane was speaking about the continuity and Sarah as well. So also the word continuity no? uh, is recurring uh, because uh, uh, there is, a, in, your, in the past, there has been movements, very important movements leading to independence. Um, then some setback, as uh, we were saying before. So we need maintenance. We need uh, to be resilient and uh, to go on. Although the circumstances, as I said before, they are not very favorable in this very moment. Um, I also noticed that uh, mm, 
about the foreign countries, uh, what it is uh, uh, expected from foreign countries. Actually, very little. There is a sense, I detect a sense of pride in uh, uh, wanting to, uh, to, to do your own job. Of course, assistance is useful. It is welcome uh, in training, in uh, uh, capacity building, uh, and so, so forth. But there is also this sense of uh, pride, proud in saying, well, we have a history. Um, our mother, our grandmother knew already, no? They are leading us, they designed the road, and so we can do it. And this is very good, this is very good. Um, and and um, in our country, we should pay attention to this point, you know, that the uh, in too much interference, okay assistance, but if it is requested and where it is requested, no more, no less. Um, no interference in our own history, in our own tradition, very important. Um, the last thing that uh, I wanted to say, <laughs> it was uh, really the last thing, um, the risk of going back. The most difficult thing to be changed, and Italy is a case in point there. The most difficult thing is not the public life, the public space, is the space for women within their family group, the cultural aspects of the scenario. It's the most, dif the most difficult to eradicate, to change, to reform. You can reform the state, but you cannot reform, you know, the, your father. <laughs> so um, in Italy, for instance, we have an experience uh, uh, of uh, a perfect legal setting, legally since the 70s, you know, through the 70s uh, uh, years and uh, fights, you know, we were able to achieve, uh, to have, uh, to achieve great results. Our legal uh, sets, laws, constitution, of course, and laws are perfect. Uh, meaning, you know, they guarantee uh, status, of women, but uh, in fact, on the ground, for instance, this year, you know how many women in Italy were killed? Usually, within the family, 59. 2020, 50, 59. What does it mean? That within the family, within the family. So a cultural problem. Um, the other thing is that, uh, Um, still, uh, in Italy, we didn't reach a, a full uh, equality on the ground, not according to the law. The law is perfect, but on the ground, full equality, um, you know, still uh, with, with the male component of the society, um, in top level positions, in private and public sector. Um, we have a very active movement, you know, which is called Dateci Voce, Let's Us Speak. This is an Italian movement, women movement. Um, I think that we should, <laughs> we should uh, uh, networking uh, because uh, the experience is not so different. Of course, uh, the, the, the scenarios are different, but the women experience uh, is not so different. We have many points in common. Um, we have a full solidarity, of course, with women in Sudan, in Algeria, but also elsewhere in the world. Um, I think that uh, I conclude this just saying that we should, uh, we should uh, not only try to network in and uh, have transnational and national networks, but uh, 
but to be as much as possible resilient. Resilient because of the uh, advancements are there, but they are not to be taken for granted. And um, they have to be implemented on the ground, including within the family. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for your remarks, your suggestion to remind us that the uh, women's struggle is a common battle, not only for Sudan and Algeria, but also here in Italy and everywhere. So I added that that it's I not so asked, good. <laughs> I, I add that uh, also have to include uh, a general uh, re rethinking of bio, so men, not only women. Is, Okay. May I add just one thing? I don't like, uh, I, I, I heard uh, the uh, Algerian colleague say, speaking about Arab Spring, the Sudanese uh, try to avoid Arab Spring. I don't like Arab Spring. Yes, the yes, Arab, we have to manage with this. They're not little flowers. There yeah, is yeah. nothing to be spring. I use the word, I don't know if you like, both of you, uh, I, I use the word Awakening, risveglio in Itali italiano, awakening. Okay. Uh, um, and I would like to, to, to use the word renaissance. <laughs> but Arab Spring is a little bit ridiculous. I don't know. <laughs> no, I that. agree. I mean, I was just using the okay. generic term because people tend to refer to it this way. Because I might say Arab reawakening oh, and nobody knows what I'm talking about. Awakening. Mm -hmm. And people Nobody understand. Nobody okay. understand awakening. I'm sorry. I have, <laughs> have to, to cut this. Things. I'm very sorry. I have to cut this. So we have a few minutes. Uh, I left the floor to uh, President Bassino for the conclusion. Just before the conclusion, I would like to also add uh, and express my thanks uh, to all participants, but also to all the women that participated, uh, uh, sharing their voices uh, and. Uh, uh, for the realization of podcast and video that we really think it's a very, very important output of this project. And I add, because I forget before, to, to, uh, to, to thanks also our Italian partner here in Italy, PAV, who realized the, uh, the interviews and the video here in Italy with Algerian and the Sudanese diaspora. Okay, I leave the floor to President Fassino for the conclusion. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Hinan and uh, Sara. Thank you very much to everybody who's uh, taken part to this meeting, which was um, uh, exceptionally interesting. First of all, thank you to our friends who uh, carried out the research and uh, described um, the content with um, extraordinarily interesting uh, results and conclusions. Also, I'd like to thank Ambassador Cardi for his presence. And also because uh, the ministry supported and funded this uh, research uh, project. I think this was rewarded by um, and uh, outstanding quality of results. And also I'd like to thank Koslovi and uh, Ambassador Merikia. Today we've been reminded is the World Day of Human Rights, the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there's nothing um, more um, in uh, tune with this than the discussion we've had uh, here uh, very, very quickly because we have very little uh, time and uh, many things have been said, which I endorse. The first thing concerns the methodology of the research because we're used to research projects which lead to papers, reports, uh, white papers written by uh, research workers. They're obviously all very thorough documents. This time, the uh, research uh, project, which led to very analytical work, was carried out extensively in the field on the ground. And I think it was very uh, useful to supplement the research with videos. I think um, 
there are nine videos if i'm not mistaken on sudan and on algeria and they're of outstanding interest because women speak they speak about their own uh, experience they speak about uh, a uh, movement of uh, revolt and that concrete experience on the ground means that the provides the written report with uh, extra intensity and strength so from a methodological point of view i think the research was very um, interesting and also the um, actual uh, report with its analysis and its uh, proposals was uh, also very valuable the two countries are um, very different well, this came out from what we've heard here today algeria comes from a history of uh, major female presence uh, and Kadi uh, reminded us that in the uh, National Liberation Front, uh, women had an essential role, and as in uh, and in the Arab world, Algerian women uh, were for a long time in the forefront uh, in terms of emancipation, their social role, and the strength of their presence, and uh, the um, defense of their rights. This. Um, um, had a was rolled uh, back, uh, which uh, greatly reduced the original um, situation. But this is something which is in uh, the DNA of Algerian women and came out again <coughs> in the Hirak uh, movement, in the great movement which we had in uh, Algeria, and which continues for renewal and change. Women uh, had and have a fundamental role, and we see them uh, return to their driving roles, which is in the culture of Algeria and the DNA of Algerian women. In Sudan, <coughs> the history is very different with a um, political history and a presence of women, which is very different. But the presence of women is no less uh, strong in this um, period. In fact, women from um, have become uh, the representation of the Sudanese revolution and the uh, transition which this country has embarked upon. So these are two countries which bear witness to the fact that women today are driving uh, forces for innovation, change, transformation, and to the fact that this is occurring in two countries, which for uh, a long period of time uh, had uh, the role of women uh, squashed um, is a um, sign of the new developments in these countries. Obviously, these are countries in transition, even though uh, with a different transition in Sudan with the stages um, which uh, have uh, occurred, um, moves away from the a lengthy military dictatorship and um, moves towards uh, the recognition of women's uh, parity and uh, female rights is essential. It's kind of litmus paper um, to m m measure the democratic and uh, liberating um, effect of the transition. In Algeria, it is a constituent part uh, women's the role of women is a constituent part in the movement uh, but as we've heard uh, it has to um, oppose a tendency on the part of uh, military and political power to squeeze demands for change and improvement and uh, transformation of the uh, ruling classes, the referendum held in Algeria a few weeks ago, initiated by the civic uh, movement, was a major criticism because uh, it seemed uh, was was criticised because it seemed more directed to stabilise the uh, members of the ruling um, uh, elites and. Uh, so I think, but so, but in both of the uh, transitions, women 
have a fundamental role. So I think what we need to do is to support these processes. And I think that um, what Ambassador Cardi is very useful and important. He reminded us that today, celebrating the International Day of Human Rights, it has been reaffirmed that one of the essential issues uh, Italy wants to stand by is uh, supporting all initiatives which aim at uh, gender parity and uh, liberating women and uh, full affirmation of uh, women's identity. And since Italy is uh, greatly involved in development cooperation and aid to countries in transition, it is a country which in the Mediterranean has one of the as this is one of the fe basic features of its uh, foreign policy. And if we uh, add these two things up, it leads us to a very clear position. Italy, which believes that gender parity, the liberation of women and the role of, um, the, of women's uh, subjectivity is essential in affirming human rights and globalizing human rights. Uh, as it proclaims this policy, it wants to implement it where its uh, foreign policy is mostly most projected in the Mediterranean is one of these uh, areas of prime importance. And this uh, shows uh, the support Italy uh, wishes to give to processes um, for and by Algerian and Sudanese uh, women, the four action plans which Ambassador Cardi announced bear witness to this uh, very concrete commitment, CESPI, which I think for having um, uh, organized this research and it's, it's a research center, it's not uh, a policy uh, center will continue to coordinate to this uh, action by uh, with other research projects to um, investigate what's happening in Algeria and Sudan on the issues we've been discussing here and also extending to other countries of the Mediterranean and uh, therefore accompanying political processes and social process with uh, uh, political and social um, <clears throat> investigation. Thanks to all of you. <clears throat> thanks to our research workers, thanks to Ambassador Carti, thanks to Ambassador Miraka, to Kozlovi, who uh, a month ago um, led us to <clears throat> deal with Sudan when the transition was uh, beginning in that country. And thanks to all of you. Also want to thank Minister Lobasso, who's responsible for the Horn of Africa office at the foreign ministry, uh, who also supported and helped us, as well as our embassy in Algeria, which uh, has helped us uh, with this. Thank you, and I wish you a very pleasant evening. Thank you, Mr. President. So I'm, I'm very sorry we have no time to open a discussion. Just say thank you again for your participation, your suggestion, your remarks, your wishes also. And I hope we have occasion to push forward our common job in the next future. So thank you again. Thank you.